What's up? Welcome in. I think Bears fans might call this a victory Tuesday <laughs> after the Packers lost last night on Monday Night Football. It's like Tommy a, freaking DeVito. It, it, wow. it's, like, it's a double dip uh, of, of wins on back-to-back days for the Chicago Bears, who I think now officially are in the hunt. <laughs> They're one game back. I mean, one game and 700 tiebreakers, but they're one game back. They're the on the list, and that's better than not being on the list. I'll, I'll give you that. Hey, I'm, I I forget playoffs. We have meaningful December games here. It's true. And, and this is a big one this week against the Browns. So I whatever. You guys can uh, poo-poo it. I'm so, not. In the last podcast, I said they're going to win three of these games. I like it. So uh, that I, would definitely put them in the hunt. I just I'm I'm very happy to be covering relevant NFL football in December. There's been too many years where that's not the case. So credit to the Bears for turning things around a couple of weeks. Credit to the Packers. Credit to Jordan Love, our guy on this show, for uh, how he played last night. Are you taking well. a victory lap here? Yeah, maybe. The Packers, Green Bay, Aaron Rodgers, go Bears. Did you see? I, I can't describe what type of route it was, but it was kind of similar. It looked like a, like some, some type of rub route option to the outside. But Matt Lafleur's face yeah. when Jordan Love, I saw it was I saw from the end zone view um, or some clip, not the not the the entire play, but the disgust on the head coach's face when that throw was thrown like I don't know five feet over his receiver who was yeah. open for a potential first down. Uh, the word I would describe Matt LaFleur from start to finish last night would be annoyed. And he just did not look like he had any fun coaching that game last night. And I think a lot of it had to do with how his quarterback was playing. And I'll say this now, granted Luke Getzey is definitely not on television as much as the head coach of the green Bay Packers is when you're the head coach, you get more camera shots, but Getzey does. They do show Getzey. I don't know, a handful of times a game. And, he never looks like he's he's pretty stoic and calm during the games. It seems like every time they cut to him, it could be after a bad play by Justin and he's just ready for the next play. Matt LaFleur comes off as just like totally annoyed when his quarterback is, is not playing well. It's, it's crazy. Well, you go from a hall of famer yeah. to a young quarterback who needs time and development. Some frustrations will show what was he? 25 for 39 last night. One TD, one interception, 76.7 passer rating. Yeah. Okay. Reasons to be upset. Reasons to have disgust on your face when you lose to the, the Tommy DeVito led Giants. Yeah. Jordan Love was, look, Jordan Love had been on a good run. I'll give him that. He, he, he really had been. Um, and I thought he played better last night, but he didn't. And the Packers. Quite frankly, I can't believe that look, they're trying to lose that game the entire time. And then they got the most Packer gift. I mean, I think we're all kind of used to the Packers getting good breaks. But Saquon Barkley fumbling that ball as he's running like wide open downfield. And then he just sort of stumbles and goes down and hadn't been touched. So the ball's loose. And it's like is this really about to happen? That's how the Packers are going to win this game because the best, like the giants don't have much, but if there's one player on the field, I would have been like, you could trust to finish this game off. It would have been Saquon Barkley and he fumbles the ball and the Packers get right back down there and they take the lead. And I'm like, that can't be happening. That's unbelievable. And then Tommy DeVito. Did you see his agent? This guy's unbelievable. Sean Stiletto. Yeah. Um, <laughs> he threw, are you just saying the agent's unbelievable or Tommy DeVito is unbelievable? The agent. Did you see that tailgate spread the DeVito family had? That's going viral this morning. Oh, I haven't Every seen it yet. Every piece morning. of Italian cuisine that you could imagine oh, was on was tables so outside good. of MetLife Stadium. Take I want to eat during the game. But uh, that was an absolute rope that he threw on that. Um, who did he throw that to? Um, on the corner route, the seven route. I mean, that was an awesome pass. What a fun story that is for the New York Giants. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and a and a big win, honestly, for the Bears. So look, their playoff chances. I think I saw the analytics this morning. 
it's like seven percent or something like that. They they need a lot of help because they have a lot of teams in front of them. We went through this exercise on CHGO yesterday, though. The thing is, is a lot of the teams ahead of the Bears play each other. I mean, the NFC South teams all play each other. Um, the the Lions or the Vikings have two games against the Lions that's in there. Um, it, there's just a lot of the, the Bears play the Falcons. So, so that's another one. The the point of all that is Bears play the Packers. Th- those t- like these teams are going to lose games. So if you do win out, I think I I do think if the Bears won out, they would still get in. I think they would get in. I'd be very surprised if they did not get in the playoffs if they win out. Now that's not going to be easy to do by any means, but it starts this week in a, a game that's I think tougher than some people are considering in Cleveland. Um, but it is on the table, and it's it's a thing that's possible, which is pretty cool. Oh, for Justin Fields, I would say this is the the most difficult challenge remaining, right? And I know the Packers brings a different energy, different level of pressure, especially if they get to that point and that game is more meaningful than the normal rivalry game. But in terms of X's and O's and having an elite pass rusher coming after you and given what happened in your last matchup in Cleveland, like this is the toughest challenge for field, like remaining. Another Big measuring look- stick for him. Yeah, another way to look at it, though, is... I think this is a tremendous opportunity. These next four games, like if the if the knock on fields and there's there's obviously more than one, but the biggest that sort of stands out is just the lack of winning with him at quarterback. And I think this gives you the opportunity here. If you really end the season on what would end up being a six game winning streak and get into the playoffs, whether you win that playoff game or not, because it's going to be tough. You're going to be the seventh seed, right? That that would go a long way into proving that, hey, like, you can win games with Justin Fields. Or maybe because of Justin Fields, depending on how the games play out. Um, I mean, they beat a good team the other day by 15 points, Johns. They did. They did. I don't want to sound like we're drunk on the Kool-Aid here, but I'm a believer in what they're doing defensively. Now I feel like the focus does shift the fields a bit to complement that. Right? It's it's making good on all those turnovers, the takeaways that the defense is providing, which the Bears are starting to do in a sense. But give me one more win against the Browns before I start talking like full in the hunt playoff scenarios. I don't want yes. to sound overly negative, but let me see you beat. Let's see you win three in a row before we start talking about winning. What's that? Four or five, six in a row? It'll be six, six wins in a if row. They, five if they were to run the table, they would end up with six in a row. Six in a row. Yeah. Because you get the Vikings game. They're on a two game winning streak right now, if that's considered a winning streak. They've won three of their past four. Again, good things are happening, but you want to see more. Got to get more. Yeah. Um, well, welcome in. Uh, we got a fun episode for you today. I'm gonna we're gonna talk. How a about little... that intro? Yeah, that was that was a good one. Um, follow us on Twitter at Adam Hogue at Adam Johns at Hogue and Johns is our show account. Uh, go check that out there and all the merch at HogueandJohns.com. Get those orders in for the holidays. I highly recommend the golf polos if you're looking for Christmas present for a Bears fan out there. Um, we appreciate all the support. Helps us continue to grow as well. And, of course, you can read John C.'s work on The Athletic, theathletic.com slash Hogan Johns. You can find me on CHGO and all CHGO.com. Um, this is a tough game this week. I realize, oh, Joe Fl- Like, the Browns quarterback situation the last few weeks especially, I think garnered some optimism that this became a winnable game and i still think it is a winnable game but i think there's a few things we got to point out we'll break down this browns game more obviously on on thursday in our game preview episode but john's they're eight and five with four different starting quarterbacks the best of which is like a broken not great deshaun watson who's no longer there and and I have to say, I'm, I mean, I haven't 
studied all of the Browns season yet or seen every snap. I've certainly seen the highlights every week. Something about Flacco the last couple of weeks that has brought some sense of stability, actually, to the whole thing, even though he just got there. But he's a veteran quarterback who obviously knows what he's doing. And if the knock on him when he basically, we all thought his career was over, was his arm strength. Like, his arm seems shot. And he seems to have that back now after the time off he's had. So I guess my <laughs> time off did some good. Yeah. I mean, my, my point is, this is a really good defense the Browns have. The Bears have a really good defense, too. And if I had to pick between two quarterbacks in this game, I feel better about Justin Fields and, you know, what he can do. But let's not forget you're going into a tough environment in Cleveland, facing a really strong defense. And this is by no means. Well, I'll say this right now. On Tuesday, I don't have the same confidence I had last week when I was fairly confident I was going to pick the Bears to win. I don't know where I'm at right now on Tuesday. My early analysis right now, Tuesday, 9.54 a.m. here in Chicago, is whether or not, like, when is the Joe Flacco comeback story going to to end, right? In in a sense. When is the magic going to, to run out? It's like the Josh Dobbs story. Like, when is this? Like, he just got benched, Josh Dobbs. So, you know what that was eventually yeah. going to end. No, like, the Bears killed Josh Dobbs. Maybe they can kill Joe Flacco. Yeah, well, not yeah, literally. Not literally, but yeah. figuratively. <laughs> like, the Tommy DeVito story. Like, fun story. But how long, uh, like, what are the legs on this? In, in yeah. a sense. Like, When's how long gonna is this going to go? You know, um, it seems like that story has legs. Sorry, Jordan Love, it does. Josh Dobbs' story did not. Joe Flacco. Is it the Bears' defense, which is better than the Jaguars' defense? Like, does that end these feel-good vibes about Joe Flacco? So they did lose two games before this one, or before beating the Jaguars, which had Trevor Lawrence basically on, like, one ankle. I don't know why he played. Um, But, yeah, we'll see. Like, I I still have confidence in Justin Fields to make a few more plays than Trevor Lawrence did on one one foot. Uh, We're going to talk to Adam Amin here in a little bit. He he called the... um... Two of the last three Bears games for Fox, of course, does the preseason games as well. Um, but before we get there, I want to talk about Justin Fields game against the Lions a little bit. I've gotten through all the, the coaches tape on this on this one, and it's not surprising to me how this all ended up like because I thought watching live. On Sunday, I'm like, man, he's doing a lot of it, I said it on the post game. This is a full Justin Fields experience. You're getting all the good, not just running, but also throwing. And you're getting all the normal frustrating stuff, like holding on to the ball too long, just being a tick late, having that extra hitch or that extra step instead of just planting that back foot and firing. It's all over the tape, all that stuff. It it backed it up completely. And you guys know that, you know, I keep grades throughout the season. I don't always talk about it on a week to week basis, but I'm going to bring it up here because I just think it's like the essence of where they're at with Justin Fields. So at the end of the day, my my final grade is I tally it all up on Justin Fields is is what I call three. OK, right on the dot. Three point zero zero. OK, that is right at the fringe of starter to long term starter. Like for in my grading system, like that's where three starts. Three up to four and a half is what I call long term starters, the guys that you want to give contract extensions to. And like this is to me the definite, not just this game, but it kind of represents all of Fields two and a half plus years now here, where he is like, this is why this decision is so tough because this is where he's at to me. He is no doubt to me a starter in the National Football League. And you're seeing all across the league, you can do a hell of a lot worse. We were just talking about Joe Flacco. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Ten seconds ago. Um, you can be in a situation where you have to win games with four different starting quarterbacks in, in, in a year. But I don't... That, let's let this thing play out, these final four weeks. But like at this point, like I don't know if he's got, ever going to get in that above first of all, supplant himself as a long-term starter, a guy where you feel comfortable paying. And he's probably not going to get to that, what what would essentially be 4.5 in my grading scale and above, which is elite 
where like that's those are the guys, you know, the top five guys in the league that you're just obviously going to pay top dollar, make them the highest paid player in the league. I, I mean, I think that's probably off the table at this point. But if he can just show that he is that long term starter, I think it's smart to move forward with him. Be, or do you chase that in the number one pick that you might have and chase like, nope, well, maybe that next guy is going to be that blue chipper. That next guy might also suck. I mean, you don't, you just don't know. You really don't know. And I, and it's just like, I, if, if I'm imagining these conversations inside Howell's Hall on a week to week basis, John's, I'm, I'm just like, I, if I was in that room, I'd be like, Justin, can you please let's just inch this up a little bit more into like definite long-term starter, not on the fringe, like just, just do this for us to make this decision easier. So not an easy decision, not easy discussions to be had by the bears at Alice Hall. What are you going off your grades? What are you looking for to get in the fours to use your grading scale? Like what's missing? Is it hitting that dagger out over the middle? Is it not missing Darnell Mooney? Is it having a better pass to Cole Komet on play action in goal to go. Like what are, what do you need in your evaluations to get to that 4.0, that 4.5 where you're like, okay, fifth year option, sign it. It's a great question. On the more grand scale, my answer is just more consistency. Can we avoid these games where I was just looking back to the start of the season where I had him in as a minus five in week one against the Packers? And I think a minus two the, the week after that. And if then I went back to last season, then there's that too. There's the minus games, and then there's the 13 he had against the Miami Dolphins last year where Mike McDaniel was losing his mind on the sideline and telling him to stop it. Right? It's that wild swing. What I'm encouraged by, I think lately to some extent, even before he got hurt, the first Vikings game was a little choppy, but there's been more consistency since the very beginning of the season. And when we mean consistency, is that specifically about the passing game? Not so much the design runs, because if you look at the numbers, like teams are stopping the ground game of quarterbacks. They are. Like defenses yeah. are adjusting. They're throwing out different personnel to contain quarterbacks and Justin Fields said it himself. The line stopped me on the design runs. It was the scrambles that were the difference. So when you say consistency, like I think when I hear the bears say consistency to me, it's, I just envision passing. Yeah. I mean, ball I, quick. Go ahead. See, I don't, I don't know if I do. I just, because, and I want to get into this a little bit more because that was more grand. I was talking about now let's get into more of the, the minute details of, of the, these games and this game in particular, because whatever he lacks, and I don't know if it's just ever going to change from an anticipatory throw standpoint, from a timing standpoint where you're just like, can you just speed this up just a tick, please? It would make such a difference. Whatever he lacks there, this dude has stuff that no one else in the league has from a rushing standpoint from a scapability standpoint. And that matters too. You can go chasing the anticipatory thrower. I'm telling you, Caleb Williams is not Justin Fields when it comes to running with the ball. He can run. He is elusive. But not to this. Dude, Justin is at the top of the top. We're talking about Michael Vick level, athleticism, and speed. Drake May and Caleb Williams are athletic. They can move. They're not going to do it at Justin Fields level. So that's the balance you have to have here. Can Caleb Williams get the ball out faster? Does he have a quicker release? Yes. Will it translate to the NFL? No idea. But I can tell you for sure right now that these guys are not going to give you what Justin Fields gives you from the running standpoint. Now, the other question, and I get it, the follow-up is always, is that sustainable? Fair question. There was a throw, though. Not that I'm going to completely flip my entire, you know, the view on Justin Fields over it. But circled in green pen, 
Johns, it happened. There was a very, very good anticipatory throw in this football game. Can I try to guess it? Is it the Cole Clement coming over the middle? No. No? No. Oh, is it the DJ Moore out of the bunch trips? Were they in bunch trips? Uh, I'm forgetting the exact formation, but it was 38 in the third quarter. First and down yes, to DJ Moore on the left sideline. Okay, yeah. And he 100% threw that ball before the breakout, and it was a legitimate. Sometimes you get like a tiny bit of anticip- anticipation. This was a legit, like Tua Tungo Valoa, getting the ball off before you even know. No one on the field knows he's open except the quarterback at that point. So it's just one example. There's definitely not enough of these on a week-to-week basis, even when Justin plays well. I'm just, when you ask that question, what are you looking for? Like, can we, can there be a few more signs of that? Four or five of those per game. That would be great. And I just don't know that he's going to get there. There's plenty of others, like that throw right before halftime where he kind of spun, he did a little almost like mini boot. And then he flips his hips. And if he gets the ball out right away, the deep shot to Mooney on the sideline, then end up getting broken up. If he throws it right away, the pass does not get broken up. But there's an extra just hesitation before he throws it. And I don't know why he does that. But he does it. And he does that way more consistently than he does you know, throw with anticipation. Again, though, I look at all the other things he does on the field. I'm like, I think I can live with that if I know I can win football games with him. So that's why this comes full circle back to how does he handle these last four games? Do the Bears win? Does he play well enough? Does he play consistently enough? And if so, I'm on board with with keeping that quarterback that I just described. Well, I think part of the discussion is what type of team do you expect to be in 2024? If you want wins... Is it best to stick with the quarterback that you know? Or is it best to go with that young quarterback, that new quarterback, that rookie quarterback that requires development regardless of how talented he is and what grades you had on him coming out of college? Like Those are two different conversations. I know some rookies have been some success, but not a lot of them do. Not a lot of them do, at least not to the level that you've seen from like a Justin Herbert or like a CJ Stroud. You know, that would be an amazing situation to draft yourself into, but there's no guarantee of that. And we know that here. We know that so well here. (laughs) Maybe the team will be better to to help with that. You are probably in great position to do that. You are in great position to do that, but... That's a difficult decision. Like there, that that's why you hire Ryan Poles. That that's this is the pressure you create for yourself when you have the first overall pick because of the great move you made in the past. By the way, Justin Herbert's an, a good example of even when you think you have the guy, even when you know you have the guy, it's still not smooth sailing. No, no. Has he? Does he have a winning record? I don't think he has a winning record. He's like right under five hundred, I believe. Okay. You know, and he's obviously good, but it's situation just, still matters. Yeah, it does. Part of me wonders if you're Ryan Poles and you need to improve the anticipation of your quarterback. How much does adding a Marvin Harrison Jr. and a Brock Bowers help with that? Mm-hmm. Elite players at their positions. Like, how much does that? Just help with everything, regardless of who's a quarterback. How much is also stability and keeping the same offense and running the same plays over and over again in game situations speed that up? Well, now no, that's another conversation because this may be a very unpopular opinion, but if you're keeping Justin Fields, I'm going to argue that you have to keep Lugetti. I agree. You're, you're not sending Justin Fields down the Jay Cutler road. As, 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 as angry as you are, like, I get the disgust, the angst with Lugetti. I do. I do. I get it. Some of that is on the quarterback, though. But if you're going to fire him, 
you now are bringing in the third offensive coordinator for Justin Fields in four years. Don't do it. Just don't do it, please. Jay Cutler had so many ups and downs throughout his career, I think, in part because of that. I think we can all agree on that. Yeah. I think a huge I, – I, I do agree. I, it, I think also part of the difference, though, is Cutler was sort of behind – why uh, so many of those offense coordinators came and went. Yeah, but isn't that always you know? kind of true, though? If, yeah, know, but like, I don't think Fields is a guy who's like try, who's going to get Luke Getze fired. You, does that make well, sense? I know you, yeah, I know what you're yeah. saying. But there, like, there's, like, there's a lot of layered discussions with Cutler there. But if the organization was smart, at some point in time, you have to say enough with the change. We have to provide a quarterback with some stability. I'm, I'm with you on that. It's like To me, it's like an all or nothing thing. Like, either... Start over, new quarterback, new system, or or keep it the same and go for stability. And again, I think that's why how they finish here in these final four games and a huge opportunity here against the Browns this week um, to get another really good win. Because really, and now Adam's coming in here in a second, like who are you hiring to replace Lugetzi if Matt Eberflus remains in place? Frank Reich? I mean, Old hopefully you coach? hire. Hopefully you hire somebody from the same offensive tree system, so the language is at least the same. Yeah, but which system are we talking about? Because because Getsy's not really from that Shanahan tree. He's more like um, McCarthy. Yeah, yeah. No, there is. It's, it's um, a lot of what they're running in Dallas. Right. right. So. Yeah. I, it, it, I, I just I, yeah the idea of having a fourth year quarterback starting over in in a in a new offense new lane it's like at that point and you have the number one no at that point just just okay fine pick the new QB start over change it all yeah yeah and, and make sure you have the right system in place for this rookie quarterback so you don't repeat the same mistakes that you made with Trubisky and the same mistakes you made with Justin Fields so uh, one guy who never commits mistakes is Adam Amin because he's just that good. Um, Adam Amin, of course, is the voice of the Bulls here in Chicago. He does MLB games for Fox, playoff games for Fox, and you hear him on NFL on Sundays. And uh, it took a little while to get a Bears game this year, at least in the regular season. He also does the Bears preseason games, right? So, um, but it wasn't until Detroit a few weeks ago that Adam Amin and Mark Schlereth, uh, who I think are a great pairing, um, they got the Bears Lions game a few weeks ago, and then they uh, got the repeat, the rematch uh, on Sunday as well. So we thought it'd be great to bring in Adam because he's, you know, been around this team a lot the last few weeks. He's had some good conversations behind the scenes uh, as part of being a TV broadcast crew. You get those meetings leading up to these games. So uh, as always, Adam can bring a lot of insight into what's been going on with the Bears. Plus, he's a Chicago guy. He's got his own opinions on Justin Fields and and the team as well. Um, so let's jump in right now with our friend, Adam. Amin. All right. Well, fresh out of a fun Bulls game last night in Milwaukee, Adam, I mean, waking up with us and uh, completely lying. If you're watching on YouTube, his caption says he's the third best Adam here and he's clearly number one and it's not even close. Wow, Kent. <laughs> no, I think Adam put that on there. Did he? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, th- I thought it was, I thought we should, we should establish a hierarchy here. I'm, ha- I'm, I'm happy to be number three here. You guys can, Duke it out at the top. I'm, I'm, I think that'd be entertaining for all of us. Oh, the, like, oh I'm like, number, like, I'm number like two. There's no yeah, question, you. but you're number one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm just happy to be with my my fellow Adams, regardless of time or uh, number of hours of sleep or lack thereof. Before I, I ask you about the Bears game, can I uh, bring up Kobe White and how well he's playing sure. right now? Yeah, like, yeah. I love his draft selection. What was it, five years ago now? Six yeah. years ago? Five That's years crazy. ago. And now he's got the contract extension playing his best basketball. What are you seeing from my guy, Kobe White? Uh, This is, to his credit, uh, he put in a lot of work in the last two offseasons. I work with a coach named Johnny Stephine, who's uh, gained a pretty good reputation around the NBA as a handles coach, as a dribble coach. And the fact is, like, Kobe was always a really fast player, but his physical tools – couldn't keep up with how fast he wanted to play the game. And I think a lot of the things that he's worked on have allowed him to catch up. Again, that's a credit to him and the work that he's put in. 
and it's it, it's paid off. I think this is a really classic example. There, it's nothing. It's not. It's nothing special other than I worked really hard, and now I'm seeing the fruits of the labor. And I have a lot of respect for how he's kind of gone about his business these last two off seasons and playing with some confidence. He got a contract that helps. You know, gives you a little bit of security and a little bit of like, all right, let's let some of the weight come off the shoulders and just go play basketball. So he's he's playing the best basketball of his young career so far. Eleven games, he's shooting like right around fifty percent from three point range. He's averaging better than four or five assists. He's putting down 20 points, put down 33 the other night. This is as good as he's played. And again, I don't think it's anything, but there's no magic formula here. It's I worked really, really hard and now I'm seeing the fruits of it. Can you take us through like the last five days of your life? Cause I'm, I, I'm sure this happens all the time, but like, so Friday night, the bulls were in San Antonio, right? Then yep. uh, I don't know how you spent Saturday, probably just prepping and working uh, unless you had a game. I don't know about, but then Saturday or Sunday, uh, you got the bears game and then Monday and you're, you're in Milwaukee with the bulls, right? Yeah, I was, uh, we, we went out to San Antonio on Thursday. Uh, those are as a newly scheduled game, right? Cause you didn't make the in-season tournament knockout stage. So everybody got two scheduled games for this week. So they played Wednesday night. We flew Thursday to San Antonio, uh, Friday night. We did the game, got to see Wembenyama for the first of, of three now. So, so it's a, a third game that you'll see Wembenyama now, uh, fun game, got on the plane with the team and we got back fairly late. Well, you know, this is obviously a longer flight from San Antonio. So I was back in my apartment, probably about 2 AM. Uh, Friday night, Saturday morning, uh, we had our meetings with the Detroit Lions staff with with Campbell and Ben Johnson, and uh, we talked with um, God, who do we? Uh, Brian Branch this week, and Sam. We talked with Sam Laporta. So those all took place right around nine a.m. Central Time on Saturday morning. So we were on the on the Zoom call with those guys for like an hour, hour fifteen minutes, and then uh, spent the rest of the day prepping, finishing up my notes. Again, it was a a little bit of an easier prep week because I we had had this matchup, you know, three weeks prior. So it wasn't like a ton of updating to do. It was a lot of just, hey, let me go watch the last couple of games highlights and and take some notes down and make sure I didn't miss anything significant in the Vikings game. You know, we did the Lions game and the Bears had a bye week. So that made things a little bit easier. Uh, we went I, I drove over to the Thompson uh, Hotel uh, over on uh, over by Russian Division to go to our production meeting on Saturday nights. So I was in there for about three, four hours uh, doing our meeting and then working a little bit. We do the game at noon. Uh, got to enjoy a, a, a game where I roll out of bed and get picked up and yeah. we go over and uh, I walked back. Actually, it, the, the weather wasn't too bad. It was like 40 degrees. So it was a nice winter walk. Got a cup of coffee and then, you know, enjoyed the city on a Sunday afternoon. Uh, got a chance to get some dinner at uh, Avli on Sunday night, one of our favorite spots. And then Monday I was back up finished uh, our Bucks Bulls notes. And then about three 30, I was on the road, drove to Milwaukee, did the game and then drove home afterwards. And uh, we got another one tonight, man. Bulls in uh, Denver playing. Well, hold on. First you're here. <laughs> well, I mean, that I thought that was fairly obvious. You know, we're, we're, you're on this. Where else would I be at this okay, point? I just, just want to be included here. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I appreciate that. <laughs> I, I appreciate that. What was like, the, I'm always interested in like production meetings and these, like, like the hour and a half zoom call you had with the lions. Like what were, your meetings like before the Bears first game with the Lions, which mm -hmm. you called, and then like for this game, like how would you compare and contrast the two interactions? You know, we we talked with Eberflus a few weeks ago and we asked like how how is the defense starting to play and how are you getting comfortable with it? Because the thing that stuck out to me the most, and especially when you see the result of it, right? You you saw the result of how well they played defensively. And it's happened for two games now. So the Lions game, they, the first Lions game, they played pretty well defensively up until that last, you know, four minute stretch where they gave up two scoring drives. And we had gone into that week asking Matt about the defense. And he said when he first took over play calling, he didn't feel like he had a rhythm going and he didn't feel like he had a great grasp of everything he wanted to do, which is an understandable scenario to be in as a, as a head coach, you now all of a sudden, when you weren't expecting it, you have to take over all that stuff. And I don't always hear coaches admit that, to be honest with you, where it's like, hey, this was hard because they never want to give the impression that they're not in command and that they're not in control. And I don't think Matt is necessarily worried about those things. You know, people have asked me a lot about Matt Eberflus the last few weeks. 
going back to that Lions game. And again, I understand it. He's probably auditioning for a job. I don't know if he is for the front office or not, but it feels like the optics have him auditioning for his job right now. And I don't think he really lets that phase him. He's just kind of matter of fact about things. And some coaches, most coaches that just want to focus on coaching are like that. They just look at what's in front of them and who are the players that I need to work with and what's the scheme that I need to come up with this week and how do we best execute it? And that game's over. All right, let's move on to the next one. And they don't really have like, they're not really focused on the big picture. They're just trying to win games and win that particular game that week. So it's a little rare at times to hear coaches admit like, yeah, I don't, I don't think I was doing a very good job with this. And he admitted that to us essentially, but he said, as we were getting into that first Detroit game, I, I feel more comfortable with the play calling the rhythm of it. We have Montez sweat. Now I feel like I'm getting a little bit better. And then we saw it play out for most of that Detroit game. We definitely saw it play out in that Minnesota game. The, the, the takeaway numbers, the last three games have been excellent. And then we saw it again on full display at home on Sunday against, again, a Detroit offense that has been as explosive as any in the NFL this year. They came in leading the league in 20-plus yard plays, and they didn't have one, until, I think, until the fourth quarter in that game, that 27-yard connection that they had. And outside of that, they didn't really have much in terms of explosive plays. So I think to see Matt think about and, and, and express that he was getting more comfortable and getting better three weeks ago, and now to see how the defense is being called and seeing it kind of play out to fruition the way you wanted it to, where you're calling the right sequencing of plays, you're putting teams into first down, uh, second down and longer situations, third down and longer situations, and then being able to unleash a little bit of a pass rush. I think that was the thing that stuck out most to me, that he was actually feeling better about the play calling, and now we're actually seeing it play out on the field. Uh, I, I'm glad you shared that because, you know, one of my criticisms at times this year with with him is just kind of a lack of admitting fairly obvious things in press conferences at times uh, and just putting a little bit more ownership on the coaches than the players at times. And I think that that has improved in recent weeks. Um, but I it's nice hearing that, too, that he, you know, because sometimes it's fairly obvious stuff like that. Like, yeah, yeah. no shit. The first couple of weeks after you were calling plays <laughs> um, when you weren't expecting to have to do that, it wasn't necessarily easy. And and I think not just him, but like you said, all, all coaches sometimes I think have uh, trouble admitting things like that sometimes just because they don't want to you know show any signs of weakness. So I just that's super interesting to me. Does he in those meetings, does he come off? Um, maybe a little bit more relaxed and a little bit more in control than I'm sure you watch the press conferences sometimes too in your prep. I rarely watch press conferences. I, I read the transcripts because I don't, I, I don't think coaches are, are really themselves in those scrums and those press conferences. The, I, I don't feel like Especially they're exactly. Flutes. <laughs> I mean, and again, Matt, Matt is definitely a kind, I, I've been saying this the last couple of weeks. Cause again, I understand why people are asking me. And I'm sure anybody who's covered Matt in, in the last month has been asked about this, especially outside of the, the local media. I think he is more relaxed with us. I think the setting is conducive to him being able to talk a little bit more freely. And again, the stuff that I'm saying here is stuff that I'm saying on broadcast. So I'm not, I don't feel like I'm betraying a confidence of any sort. You know, we, we judge and parse what we deliver from those meetings, but once Sunday comes, it's pretty much fair game unless a coach has strictly said, hey, this is off the record. Like, this is embargoed until kickoff, until game day. And after that, I'm going to – everything you said in that meeting, the understanding is, yeah, we're going to bring that out in some way. If you need me to, like, parse something or to – you know, I, I appreciate when coaches are like, hey, this guy's not playing particularly well. Like, you'll know how to say this. Like, Mike Tomlin is very good about that. He's like – He's doing this really, really poorly, but I don't want you to throw him under the bus. But I'm letting you know that if you see this, this has been a problem. So you guys interpret it the way you interpret it. I'm giving you fair warning about it, but I'm not telling you like Mike Tomlin thinks this guy's terrible. And you don't really hear that from most coaches anyway. They're not going to throw their guys under the bus. Good guys, good human beings, whether they're in a press conference setting or in a, in a setting with us in a production meeting, or in the post game, they're not going to throw their guys under the bus. They're just not. They're going to wait till practice. They're going to wait till the private moments. They're going to wait till film sessions to do it. Matt comes off like that type of good guy. 
And I think I'm starting to see why players are gravitating towards him. Now, it helps when you're winning, when you're playing better, when you're getting results, even if the wins aren't there, like the loss against Detroit th- three weeks ago is, I think, a good you know, good evidence of that. Like, hey, we didn't win the game, but like, do you see what we're doing here? Like, I think that's the message he was trying to deliver over the course of the last few weeks. Like, we can do this. We can play with anybody. This is a really good offensive football team, and we shut them down. Oh, and by the way, our offense actually put up points against him this time a better than league average number. So I think with us, he has a little bit more freedom. I think he feels a little bit more comfortable, but all the stuff that he talks about, like we, we mentioned on air. So I like him as a guy. I think he's a good human being. I think guys are starting to gravitate towards him because he, they're seeing some results. And I don't think he's like a CEO type, which is okay. You don't have to be like, the like you have, you don't have to have a, your finger on the pulse of every single thing as a head coach if that's not how the organization is structured for you and that's not what your skill set plays to. So I, I think he's a really good football coach. Like, give me a player, tell me what his deficiencies are, and I'll figure out how to make him better. But like the CEO role doesn't really seem to fit him. I think the actual coaching is is not really an issue when it comes to the mechanics of football how to be a better defensive player. Like, I think he's a good coach. And when you win, it's easier to latch on to the guy. And when you're losing, it's understandable to not because I think he understands too that this is a bottom line business. This is a results-based, bottom line, big money business. And that's how it is. You have to be able to do all the other things to some competency so you can focus on being a good football coach and trying to get your team to be, play better. So I think that's where he's at right now. I'm curious, like which players did you meet with then? And then, well, th- well then later, I guess before mm-hmm. both games and then like, what type of energy vibe did you get from them? And then I guess the third part of this question is like, did you see maybe this win against the lions coming in their second matchup? I, I, we talked with Montez sweat the last meeting uh, so this was, I guess, would have been his third game with the Bears, if I'm not mistaken, because this was five. So thought it have been his third game with the Bears. He was getting acclimated. Uh, he hadn't had a sack yet, but you could tell, like, he kind of felt like it was coming. And he felt comfortable in the system right out of the gate. And I think part of that is just because Montez Sweat is a talented player. You could probably throw him in any system, and he'd probably be like, yeah, I know what, I know what I'm doing. Uh, but he, he seemed to acclimate very quickly. So you got a good sense of him pretty pretty early when he was with Chicago. Uh, this past meeting, we had TJ Edwards, who's a, who was a great guy to talk to. And and I know uh, Hogue loves him just because of his Wisconsin roots. But, like, I, I feel like he, he was already starting to feel some of the things that Matt was talking about and, and that the defense was starting to come around and that they were feeling better. And it's easy for me to sit here in hindsight and be like, I, th- I thought the Bears were going to win. I kind of thought the Bears were going to win because Detroit's been having defensive issues. And, and I'm also, a, I, I, this is just a, my, my personal thing. Like I'm a victim of like recency bias all the time. I find myself when I talk with somebody and I believe what they're saying and I'm impressed by what they're saying, I have a tendency to go, I think they might win this game. Now I've, I've done that with every coach. I did that with Frank Reich in his last game with Carolina for like a split second. Even I was like, Hey, they might win this game. And they were down one score in the final, you know, in the final possession. So, you know, I wasn't that far off, but like uh, I, I did walk away from the meetings this time around, especially after their performance, the first meeting and what they did against Minnesota and kind of seeing where Detroit's at with some of their concerns. I was like, you know what? The bears might actually be in this game in the fourth quarter. This might be a close game. And they might actually win. I didn't think that it would be, you know, a two score win, essentially. But I felt good about their chances just based on how TJ was talking about how quickly they're acclimating to certain things. I think Getsy, you know, was feeling some of the pressure. And I think he wanted to do a better job of play calling and sequencing, which I think you're, it was it was a little bit better than, it, than we saw in the Detroit game. And I thought it was much better down the stretch. Uh, than it was in the Detroit, the first Detroit meeting. It was certainly better than what we saw against Minnesota in the second and third quarters. So, yeah, a little bit of a sense. Like, all right, they they feel good. 
And when I walk out of a meeting with a coach and I feel like they feel good, that kind of resonates with me personally. It's just, I just kind of pick up on the energy a little bit. So they felt pretty good about it. So in turn, I kind of, I kind of walked away thinking, all right, this might be a game. This might be a really good game. So, and then I think we're all wondering, um, how do they feel about the quarterback, right? Like that's the big lingering, lingering question. You have sort of an interesting perspective here because I mean, not, not only have you had two of their last three games, uh, the first, you know, Justin played, I thought really well in the first game against the lions, still pretty well, uh, although not perfect on Sunday. And then the Vikings game was just kind of a weird game, but, um, also the preseason as well. Just where did you, where did you, what just general thoughts on Justin Fields from the last two games you've been able to call on him and him coming out of that thumb injury as well. Conversations you had behind the scenes with the team, that type of stuff. Just, just where do you feel like he's at right now? I, I think they're fans. Uh, it seems like they're fans. And again, I don't think a coach is really going to throw a, a quarterback who's still in the midst of starting your final month of the season under the bus either. But I feel like they have confidence in him. I feel like they do see progression. Matt Matt was pretty adamant. Like, you, I see the progression. I see the growth. And based off the last three starts, yeah, I've seen some of the things that I think – I mean, like, what are we talking about brass tacks here? We're talking about paying the guy, right? Like, you're coming down to it. In May is when that option deadline comes up, and you have quarterbacks in the next draft that you could potentially choose from if you wanted to reset – your salary cap clock on that position, which is obviously a very important thing in this league because the quarterback position is the highest paid and it takes up a lot, a good chunk of your salary cap and you're going to have to pay Justin Fields, I think, eventually somewhere in the area of 140 to $160 million because Daniel Jones, who has gone to the playoffs and has won a playoff game, is or got paid 160 and prices are only going up. So at worst for Justin Fields, who doesn't have a great record, you're going to have to pay him some money. And if you want to reset your salary cap clock on the quarterback position, you can. You have the opportunity to more than likely. I personally feel like there's enough there where he can grow at a pretty exponential rate with the right people around him. I'm personally – not a fan of how the marriage has worked between Getsy and Fields overall. That doesn't mean it can't work, and it doesn't mean they haven't had good moments and that they haven't had good games. I thought the scripts the last three games to start the games were excellent. We saw really good drives from Justin Fields. We saw great play calling sequencing. We saw a great mixture of run and pass. We saw a great uh, picture of what he is capable of and why the Bears are – and I've said this for the last two years, accidentally ahead of the field in the NFL when it comes to the quarterback position because the, the, the position's evolving and you have a guy that has the skill set of what the future and, and I guess current era really and, and the near future of the NFL, the quarterback position can look like. The mobility, the expanse to, uh, expansive playbook, uh, the multiple things that he can do that he's capable of doing. I think he has all the physical tools in the world. I think his receivers at times have made poor efforts to catch balls, especially the younger guys. And at times he's missed guys when he shouldn't. And not by much, but by enough in the NFL. Uh, Mark Schlereth, my partner, was very adamant about anticipatory throws on Sunday. Like, you have to learn how to throw guys open. And he's right. Because I've talked with five offensive coordinators this year that have young quarterbacks, and all of them have said, I just want him to let it rip. Like, you got to throw guys that don't look like they're open. You have to throw them open. And also, sometimes you have to let your receivers, who are getting paid as well, go make a play. And you have to trust them sometimes. And the times he has, DJ Moore's made plays. And sometimes he has. Guys have dropped passes. And at times, he hasn't thrown the ball properly. It's a combination of a lot of things. But I don't think it's anything that's insurmountable for an NFL quarterback to, to start doing that leads to some high-quality efforts. I think you got to get a, a play caller in there that feels comfortable. And if Luke Getzey starts to feel comfortable the way he seemingly has the last couple of weeks early in games, and I think a little bit better later in games, then all right, maybe this marriage can work a little bit better. But I think there's enough physical tools there, and there's going to be enough opportunity to bring in more weapons around Justin to where he probably is a really viable quarterback in this league. And look at the current state of the NFL, guys. There's 
11 quarterbacks, 12 quarterbacks out of 32 that you're really like, hey, that's that's really good. That guy, I I trust that guy to go to the playoffs one day. I trust that guy to win a game for me in, in the final three minutes of a game. There's a there's 12 guys. It's 12 out of 32, 6 out of 16, 3 out of 8, 37%. Less than 40% of the quarterbacks in the league, you'd go, give them to me. I'll, I'll I'll take them right now. So there's no guarantee about Caleb Williams, even though like I still think he's close to the most draftable quarterback there is and that, that we've had in, in, in a draft for a couple of years. I'm still sold on Justin. I, I've been adamant about this for a while. I think he's physically capable, and I think he is more than capable of learning NFL offenses and the nuances of one with the right system and with the right guy calling the plays. Another work-related question. Like I've asked this to Jeff Joniak too. What's it like calling one of his games where he's a yard in the end zone and now all of a sudden he's scrambling for 19 yards and escaping pressure and like you, like you kind of said there, like not many quarterbacks can do that. Like what's it like calling that in the moment? And then what do you think that kind of does – like as you're seeing all this and trying to encapsulate all that, like what that does for his teammates, for that for that sideline. I thought about the Green Bay game last year when he was hurt. You know, he was coming back from the shoulder issue, and he was, I'm playing, I'm playing, I'm going out there, I'm playing. It's important for me. He told us it's important for me to go out there and play because I need them to see that I'm willing to go out there for that, which I thought was a resonant statement. You know, it was a resonating statement to, that he wanted his teammates to know that he was going to be the first guy on the front line. So I appreciated and respected that. I think now when you watch him make these types of plays, guys are more like um, not in awe. I think that, I think we've seen enough of it over the last couple of years where it's like, like he, we know he's capable of doing this, but I think there's still a little bit of a jaw drop factor with him where you're like, how, how did he just do that? And how many, like I said, how many guys in the NFL do you really look at? Like Mahomes is obviously at the top of that list of things that quarterbacks do where you're like, how are you capable of, of doing that? How did, how, were you, how did you have the wherewithal? That play against Tampa Bay on a Sunday night game last year kind of sticks out to me with Mahomes. Like, how did you see that? And how did you flip that? Like, just the stuff that they're doing. Um I think Fields has that. He has that capability of like, how did he do that type of stuff? And the scramble where he probably should have been sacked at the two, uh, Hutchinson and Anzalone both had shots at him. They should, probably should have had him, frankly. And he's strong and slippery and elusive and fast. And he was able to turn that into a play. Um, I mean, I, I did the San Francisco game a couple of years ago, maybe the first real big moment of his career where he had that incredible scramble and Jason Peters threw that block on Fred Warner and he scored a rushing touchdown of uh, some of the throws that he's made the last couple of times that we've had him, the, the two throws to DJ Moore in both of these lines game, the fourth and 13 game, uh, play with uh, you know, the adjustment at the line of scrimmage and getting the jump on Hutchinson and, and being able to get a touchdown on that play. Uh, I think you're starting to see that he clearly has an ability to play beyond what's on the field, what's on tape, what's on film, what's on, uh, what's on the sheet in the playbook. He can play above that. And I think physically it's hard to find guys that can do the things that he can do. Now, is he taking a lot of punishment? Yes. I think that also garners a little bit of respect from his teammates. I think his teammates are kind of all in the same mode. Like this guy can do some stuff, man. You heard Jaquan Brisker talk about it. You heard DJ Moore. These guys are all, all notice it. They all see it. And they're like, this guy makes plays that other quarterbacks just don't you know, or not very many other quarterbacks can make. So I think his teammates have recognized that. And maybe that's just part of the natural growth process. You know, we have so many expectations on guys in the first three or four years that we forget that a lot of these guys may not ever blossom until their fifth or sixth or seventh year. And I know the clock has changed in the NFL the last 10 years, maybe even 15 years where those expectations because of the money, because of the big business nature, because of the bottom line nature of this, you expect results right away but we have kind of forgotten about the development and growth process for a lot of these young players. And I think he's kind of hitting the stride that could propel him to the next level in his growth. I'm not saying he's there and I'm not saying he's going to get there, but I think the the tools and kind of the, the, the structure and infrastructure is there for him to make the jump that I think is necessary for a player like him to make. 
the jaw drop factor. I am stealing that sure. almost immediately. That, that's going to be in a column coming up. I'll, I'll cool. give you credit, though, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. I, I like yeah, that. Yeah, because, like- because you're right, though. There's like I never had that with Trubisky, maybe outside a couple times. But with sure. Justin Fields, there's at least a few of those moments every single game that he plays. Like even his bad games, yeah. you get one one or two of those moments. Yeah, and and again, just say Adam said it, and people will, will not know which Adam, and that's fine. <laughs> I'm okay with the, the mystery surrounding this this trio that we have. Um, it's accidental, right? Like they kind of, they, they, I know they traded up and they wanted to they wanted to get Fields. They felt passionately about him, you know, in the previous regime. But Ryan Poles has kind of just stumbled upon this, and it's like you're ahead of the curve. You have all the salary cap space. You already have a quarterback that kind of is playing towards more of a modern style of football. You have defensive stars or future stars or potential stars or at least very solid players on every level of your defense. You're adding pieces on the offensive end because you had the salary cap space to do so. And the Carolina Panthers are bad. So you're going to get a number, likely a number one overall pick again on on this coming draft, plus another potential top 10 pick. Uh, although that's kind of, you know, skirting a little bit as you, you see the Bears kind of enter the middle of the pack again, even if it's at the bottom tier of it. So you kind of find yourself in an advantageous position to build something here because Fields does seemingly, in my estimation, and I would say in probably other people's uh, estimation, but I think in a lot of people's uh, mind has all the necessary elements to be a playoff caliber quarterback. Like, that's what we're talking about. We can talk about, hey, he's growing, he's he's getting there. But again, the bottom line business, you're trying to win playoff games. Get there and then win them. And he's got the tools at the very least because Lamar Jackson has been to the playoffs. He's made a couple of decent runs. Not hasn't gotten where he needs to yet, but he's made some good runs and he's won an MVP. Josh Allen, Patrick Mahomes, all these guys are the, the, the cream of the crop that we're kind of talking about for the most part. And – he has the elements of of some of those guys. He's not those guys, but he's got the elements of them, and that's all you're looking for when you're trying to build and develop and create a structure for a team that wants to make deep runs. Which NFL game do you have this week? Speaking of those Carolina Panthers, this is how life is as a regional NFL broadcaster. Some weeks you get the game, you know, one of the best games of the week in Detroit and Chicago, and some weeks you have to watch Carolina uh, struggle to get any offense going against uh, the Atlanta Falcons. But again, the NFC South is just kind of a an enigma right now. The NFC in general is kind of mid, you know, by by you know standard. Uh, it's a lot of middle of the pack teams. That's fine. It, it makes for competitive football at the very least. But the NFC South, you got three teams at six and seven, and Atlanta is one of them. So technically, talking about a first place team trying to make its way into the playoffs. So I guess that's our that's our hook on Sunday. That that division is definitely going to have like an eight and nine winner. I, I hate when like losing teams make the playoffs, but well, yeah, I, I like how you're like saying that like it's a novel thing in the NFC South. Like, oh man, I think the, the team <laughs> that wins the division is going to be under 500. Have you watched that division the last two years? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I'm with you. <laughs> That's how it is. Plus, the seven seed might have that same losing record as t- too, depending on how this all plays out. And that could somehow put the Bears in position here, depending on. You know what they can do in these coming weeks. It's gonna be interesting. A tradition like no other, guys. In December, the Bears with a sub five hundred record are in the hunt. <laughs> All right, I can't let you go without asking this question. Um, where does baseball fall in your your uh, list of priorities? games you like to call career because uh, I think we all know there's a pretty high profile job open in this town right now with uh, Jason Benetti all of our friend Jason Benetti uh, moving on to Detroit Um, do do you have interest in that job and you know just where I guess where does that where would that fall on the priority list I love baseball I love calling it I'm thankful to get to call it for Fox and to you know get through playoff games and kind of get to call call baseball at a high level but uh, if I took the White Sox job that would mean I would have about 30 days off a year. And <laughs> I don't think I can function as a person. I barely made this interview at nine in the morning. So I cannot imagine how awful it would be and how terrible I would be day to day if uh, suddenly I added a, you know 130 games or 125 games to the schedule. Uh, it's, not jo- it's not my job to have. It's, uh, it's a great job. It's, it's uh, a baseball team in one of the best cities in, in the country. And... It's fun to go to the ballpark all summer long and call games. 
I'm happy with my schedule. I'm happy to have some downtime and I'm happy to be able to call the amount of baseball I do relative to what I do football and basketball season. So it's not, it's not my job to have. I've told them, I've said it publicly and uh, I'm happy to help in any way, shape or form. You know, those, those are great people uh, that, that run the broadcast side for, for NBC sports Chicago. And, and uh, I haven't dealt with a lot of the white Sox people, but I know a few of them and, and I know they're, 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 doing their due diligence to find the best person for it. It's a great job to have. It really is. It's just not the job for me. And hey, well, we're happy we get to talk Bears football with you. I'm, I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to be part of that. I, how often would I lose that? Part of the trio? I'd be too tired. I wouldn't be yeah. able to, to muster up any energy to, to be part of the, the, the Adam triad here. Well, I was going to say, look, as a White Sox fan and as an Adam Amin fan, that makes me sad. But I I appreciate, <laughs> I definitely appreciate what you're talking about uh, from having, I think all of us on this podcast uh, can appreciate the idea of having some free time uh, when we can sneak it in. And also, if it was between you calling White Sox games and coming on this podcast, I mean, I, I don't, obviously. <laughs> we do sacrifice, is that what we, you're saying? Yeah, we need you on Hogan John, so uh, we'll exactly. take it. I think he's trying to get you to come on the podcast 120 times a year. Yeah, no. I think that's what it is. So that that's what that's what he's he's angling at more than anything else. Did Benetti fall for this too? Did, did you finally <laughs> were you trying to get him on the on the pod as a as like a weekly? Why guest? do you think he moved to Detroit? Yeah, exactly. that was you know <laughs> what people don't know is that somewhere woven in all that you know that that movement was the show. Even though I don't think yeah. Jason's ever been on this show, I've interviewed yeah, you know, him. It wasn't written about or anything like that, and Jason probably hasn't been on this show. We knew, we knew what you were yes. trying to get for him. <laughs> Come on, it's, everyone knows uh, what's going on. Happy for him, sad for us. Yeah, it's it's it stinks not having him in town. You know, he's he's my guy, and we become good friends over the years, and I have a lot of respect for the guy. I mean, I'm I'm glad he's still my colleague. He's still my my Fox colleague, but you know, we don't we won't get to see him as often. We won't get to have uh, dinner at Chicago Cut uh, with Dave and company as uh, as often as we'd like now. Yeah. Uh, some days we got to hear, or someday we got to hear stories from the Chicago broadcasters dinner that you guys have. Well, that that's the other thing, man. Like that's what we were so excited about. We he and I had talked about that for months. We're like he and I, were like we got to make this happen. The New York guys do it. Why can't we do it? And we finally made it happen this summer. We were so happy to do it. So I was like, all right, cool. The first of many, and now we 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 lose him. <laughs> so maybe we'll have to try to time it out. Uh, if uh, whenever the Tigers come back into town, I know they're here for. I think you're here for opening weekend, of course, because why wouldn't they be? But uh, maybe when uh, when the Tigers are back in town during the summer, we'll have to find a way to, to bring them out for another uh, Chicago broadcast dinner. Adam, we really appreciate the time. Get some rest. We'll uh, we'll catch you on the Bulls game tonight. And um, as always, we appreciate it, man. You guys are the best, man. Appreciate you both. Thanks, All right, Adam. there he is, Adam Amin. Well, we love that guy here on this show. He's the absolute best, great human being as well. And um, I don't know, we'll see. You know, thoughts and prayers to him during the Panthers game this week, but um, see if we can, maybe he can bring home another Panthers loss. We'll, we'll pick that game later in the week just for him. Yeah, in the first pick. Yeah, um, and, and a little he can do some scouting too. The Bears play the Falcons in a few weeks, so there you go. Um, all right, voicemails. I don't know what to expect this week. I'm not used to this. I don't know. I don't a good game, a good win. Almost from start to finish, there's a little. And I'm sure it'll get a little rough here in the middle, but I, I cannot. I don't know. I don't. I, I don't know what to do with my hands. Like, wh- wh- how do we? <laughs> what's going to happen here with these voicemails? I'm not sure. People calling in the voicemail line knew this. Knew what to say this week. Um, here they are. Your voicemails from Sunday's convincing win over the NFC North leading Detroit Lions. Hello. Do you know who this is? Oh, you didn't know. <laughs> Your ass better call somebody. The Hogan Johns voicemail. The Hogan Johns voicemail line. Believe it or not, George isn't at home. Please leave a message at the beep. Got any questions or comments about the Bears? Give the guys a call before, after, or even during the game. Go Bears! Hoggy Cat, Johnsy, Bad Bob, the Broxy calling in here from BEA, beautiful Soldiers Field. It is a crisp, like, 20 degrees or something out here. Uh, the Bears are playing possessed. They, they just, they're up 10-0. It's about the second quarter. Uh, 
Justin Fields, Justin Denzel Fields playing like a man on fire out there, running around the ball, throwing it. He looks incredible out there. We just got a pick from Jalen Johnson. That guy can catch anything apparently now. Uh, I don't know what this team is, but they look like they're uh, Super Bowl contenders all of a sudden. Uh, maybe they're, I don't know, maybe they're, they're playing inspired ball. But let's go Bears. I don't know what's happening here. This is crazy. What a season we've got here. What a roller coaster ride. That's the Bears football. Chicago Bears, Bears down. Who knows what's going to happen the rest of this team, this season, this game. I'm predicting an easy, breezy, beautiful cover girl win, 55-0, to zero, Chicago Bears. Currently enjoying a sausage, egg, and cheese McGriddle and a Diet Coke. I will be meditating until kickoff of this Bears-Lions game at Soldier Field and manifesting a Justin Fields career resurgence game as the franchise quarterback. Four touchdowns, no interceptions, 30 to 2, bear down. What did I just see with that fourth down and one play? What a stupid call. Prime area to do the tush push. Getsy, stop being cute. Stop outsmarting yourself. Just be simple, you idiot. Bear down. Luke Getze needs to be drawn and quartered after that D.J. Moore fourth down call. What in the hell are you doing? What are you doing, you freaking moron? Bear down Omaha here. Fourth and one, Getze going to Getze, and you give it to D.J. Moore. You kidding me? Give it to anybody else, maybe even Justin Fields. God, it's just painful every week. It's halftime, 13 unanswered points. And the Bears are doing what they've been showing us all year long. It's time for a reboot. Groundhog Day. Here we go. Two back-to-back three and outs to start the second half. Then you get a big punt return. Got momentum on your side. Let's hope Getsy just doesn't piss down his leg and give it right back to the Lions' dead like he did with that fourth down in the first. Seven minutes to go. The Bears 28, Lions 13. That's all there is in the game. Time to call the betting and choose the Lions to make some big cash. Hey, Jim Carrey, what's David Montgomery? Loser! All right, five minutes to go. Nice stop on D. Don't f*** this up. Just run clock. Don't f*** this up. Just run clock. And so on and so on. Come on, Bears. Much better than a few weeks ago. Let's stack these wins. Bear down, baby. I don't know what the f is going on, but I'm actually enjoying this. OG Chad, John Z, babe, I'm on my way outside the uh, soldier field after the game. Jalen Johnson made the interception just like you predicted. Bears won. What else can you ask for? Let's go. Bear down. Hey, Bears fans, Z Man here. We're starting to turn things around. Bear down! Keep doing it for B man. That one fan at the end there sounded like he had a long fun day at Soldier Field. Yeah. It's in yeah. Good for him. I was not expecting a Jim Carrey reference in there. No. That was uh that one caught me off guard a little bit. Uh always appreciate the voicemails as always. Keep them coming, even during the wins. It's, it's like easier to call and yell into a phone when you're upset but those it's, we got some of those yeah so, oh yeah oh yeah gets is still <laughs> gets <he's> still like, <laughs> target number one on the voicemail line uh without a doubt um all right well fun episode today thanks for uh joining us adam amin always love talking to him when we get our chances busy 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 man um and we'll see if he gets another bears game uh, the rest of the way we'll be back on thursday to break down this game against the browns i think it's a Fun matchup, honestly. I think it's it's going to be a good game. I think it's uh, sort of an underrated game on this week's slate, and um, I can't wait to break it down. This is the game, um, since the NFL went to a 17-game 17, 17 schedule, this is like the random AFC team that you play because this year was the AFC West, and now you get the random game that you play against a different division. That's what this game is against the Browns on the road. Not an easy one. But one, the Bears can win and kind of make a statement if they're really for real, if they're really in the hunt 
they can win this game on Sunday. So we'll break here's it down. another Jim Carrey reference. So you're saying there's a chance. Yeah. There's a chance. I got to really grind the next 48 hours and figure out who I'm picking in this game. I don't like very 50 50 on it. To be honest, I'm probably 51% Browns right now. So we'll see if that. What was that probable or was that make them probable or doubtful or outful? No, outful. Pro, uh, 51% is doubtful. Yeah. Well, I'm, so yeah, if, I was if trying to go 50, off. 50 of, 50, you're questionable. The flu is this thing earlier in the year where he was doubtful, but out. He was outful. He's outful. I don't even remember who that was about. Oh, the seasons are too long. It was Justin Fields. Oh, yeah. He's outful. Okay. Um, that things are just better when you win a couple of games, huh? Always. We'll keep it going. Thursday, Bears, Browns. We'll break it all down with you then. See ya. See ya.